On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Starship's first flight reveals a major design problem, Japan's Hakuto-R commercial lander runs out of fuel and slams into the moon, and Rocket Lab finds plans for a test flight with a pre-flown engine. This is The Space Race. It's been just about two weeks since SpaceX made their first Starship test launch on April 20th, Data and debris are still being sifted through in order to get an accurate picture of both what went wrong and the changes that will be needed to move forward with the Starship project. But one thing at least is clear. Starship has a big problem. The launch itself went relatively well for a first test. The world's most powerful rocket was able to lift off and power to an altitude of about 39 kilometers before losing control, pulling a couple flips in an attempt to right itself, and then exploding when the flight termination system kicked in. This sort of performance, while being somewhat disappointing, is much more in line with the average test of a new rocket. The goal of a test launch is to get as much data as possible, and failing to reach orbit and then exploding certainly gets a lot of data. But it was the damage to the launch area at the company's Boca Chica test facility that was a real cause for concern. The site was torn to shreds by the forces of the Super Heavy booster, and the chunks of concrete blasted out of the pad beneath the orbital launch mount. Damage from the launch was reported as far away as Port Isabel, Texas, where broken windows, ash, and even what appears to be sand affected the community. According to CEO Elon Musk, the design solution for Starship launch pads, a water-cooled steel plate, was not ready in time for the FAA launch license, and SpaceX engineers believed, based on the data gathered at the static fire test on February 9th, that the special heat-resistant Fondag concrete pad would stand up to the force and temperature of a full launch. If that's true, then they missed the mark by quite a bit. Engineering calculations are complicated and rely on many factors that aren't always a case of simple numbers. A lot of the variables have to be estimated based on the data an engineer has available to them, so it's understandable that they could have been mistaken, but this is a huge mistake. The crater directly under the orbital launch mount shows us that lesson, but it also reveals the biggest challenge SpaceX now faces. How are they going to get this monster under control? In a Twitter Spaces event held last week, Elon reported that the damage to Starbase wasn't as bad as initially thought. The dented orbital tank farm and the shredded drawworks on the Mechazilla Tower were easily the most gnarly looking, but the Mechazilla chopsticks were lowered for repairs recently, so the drawworks is fine and the tanks in the fuel storage farm are actually just some exterior shielding and can be easily replaced. It's the crater that is the real issue. Because whether this was a mistake with the math or just a resurgence of that classic SpaceX recklessness doesn't really matter. That damage isn't just inconvenient, it's very possible that the reason Starship lost control is because it damaged itself on the launch pad. The engine housings of a rocket are built to withstand the force generated by their engines. That's a given, but otherwise, they are filled with very delicate machinery. The pumps, engine bells, and the gimbling mechanisms that allow the engines to steer the rocket are all finely tuned and easily disrupted. So when Starship's 33 Raptor V2 engines wash the pad with over 7,590 tons of force and blew it to pieces, some of those chunks likely got shot into the engine cavity of the first stage booster. This is because on Earth, air pressure and gravity keep engine blooms more concentrated. If you've ever seen a rocket reach higher altitudes and wondered why the engine flames suddenly spread wider, that's why. The air pressure and gravity are decreasing and so it spreads out. This is also why NASA doesn't worry so much about landing vehicles on the moon or Mars without a pad. On Earth, a concentrated plume would cause ejecta, material from a newly formed crater, to possibly lodge itself in the engines. But on places like Mars and the moon, engine plumes wouldn't make much of a crater, and the debris wouldn't get pushed around as much. Back at Boca Chica, however, that super heavy booster tunneled into the concrete. All that amount of force needed was to make a crack in the pad. Once concrete is cracked, it begins to lose its strength, and after that, the engine plume likely created a pressure pocket and blasted pieces upwards like a geyser. Now, SpaceX's plan to use a liquid-cooled steel plate is a good one. Scientists like Dr. Phil Metzger of NASA KSC Swampworks 
uses a similar solution when testing landing vehicles designed for other planets. That plate, especially when combined with a deluge system that's already installed in the OLM at Boca Chica, would pretty much solve the crater problem. The issue is that it's a little too late for that. The FAA is not happy with the results of the April 20th test flight, and it's hard to blame them. SpaceX didn't have to take this risk, and now they are not only going to have to take a lot of time to make extensive repairs before attempting to install this new steel plate system, but they are going to have to jump through a lot of hoops before the FAA grants them another launch license. Elon predicted that the damage should be fixed in as little as two months and said that there are still four or five Starship launches planned for this year, but the repairs to the OLM alone look like they're going to take a while. Then they have to finish that deluge system they installed back in September last year, install and test the water-cooled steel plate system, and, of course, fill in that crater. That is a lot of work on top of trying to convince the FAA that they can handle another launch. I don't think anyone is worried about if SpaceX will be allowed to launch again, but we will likely have to wait a little longer to make sure that the next launch nails it. Safety first this time. Japanese company iSpace has lost their Hakuto-R lander after losing communication during its descent to the lunar surface on April 25th. This mission was attempting to become the very first privately funded moon landing, but just before the automated probe was scheduled to begin its touchdown procedures, the iSpace mission control lost communication with the vehicle. Telemetry was still being sent back, but the team could no longer issue orders, and just before the final landing was confirmed, iSpace stopped receiving anything from their probe. Not long afterwards, iSpace CEO Takeshi Hakamada reported that we have to assume that we could not complete the landing on the lunar surface. A rough call to make, but the last bits of telemetry sent by the doomed Hakuto are, and the data blackout supports the guess that the vehicle made a hard landing, meaning it likely slammed into the lunar surface way too fast and was destroyed. The last reports from the probe indicated that it was just 90 kilometers above its intended landing site, Atlas Crater, and falling at a rate of 33 kilometers per hour, and that would have been fine, but another reading at the same time showed that the Hakuto's fuel reserves were lower than it needed to land. So, the unfortunate probe ran out of fuel partway down and just fell the rest of the way. Unsurprisingly, fuel calculations for a lunar landing are complicated. Usually, missions to space over budget for fuel just in case, but as this was a privately funded endeavor, iSpace was likely trying to be efficient with their propellant reserves. Everything about this mission was designed with efficiency in mind. They launched in December 2022 and took a long gravity propelled orbit to ensure they didn't have to waste fuel burning directly for the moon. This orbit took the probe over 855,000 kilometers from Earth the furthest that any commercially operated spacecraft has ever flown. The Hakuto-R itself is a legacy project from the 2007 Google Lunar X Prize competitions that challenged privately funded teams to develop and launch a new lander for the moon by 2018. The Hakuto, which means white rabbit in Japanese, was meant to be a hireable landing system that would ferry customer payloads to the moon. None of the XPRIZE teams were able to meet the deadline, but Team Hakuto, run by Takeshi Hakameda, was one of the five finalists. Not to be defeated, Hakameda, who founded iSpace in 2010, would continue development of his lander. The vehicle's solid design drew partners like Arian Group, who supplied the main engine for the probe, and SpaceX, who launched the Hakuto aboard a Falcon 9 back in December. The mission was also supported by several customers who paid to have their payloads brought to the moon, including the United Arab Emirates and their tiny 10-kilogram rover Rashid. Rashid was meant to be the UAE's first foray into lunar operations and was intended to study the moon's surface and aspects of lunar regolith and dust. It's never easy to lose a mission, especially so close to the finish line, but the Hakuto-R got very close, and it seems that the only issue was the amount of fuel they calculated for was a bit off. Hakameda and iSpace have diligently worked on this landing system for almost two decades now, and they have no intentions on giving up. So, good luck on the next flight, iSpace. Rocket Lab is continuing their march towards reusability with the announcement that the company would be attempting to launch one of their Electron rockets with one flight-tested or previously flown engine mixed into the rocket's usual array of nine 3D-printed Rutherford engines. 
There's been no word on an exact date, but unless there are major issues with refitting this pre-flown engine, the test launch will likely happen sometime this year. The April 19th announcement comes a little over a month after CEO Peter Beck suggested that the company would abandon attempts to catch their Electron rocket's first stage with a helicopter, a maneuver that they very nearly succeeded at last year. However, after some testing on engines recovered from the ocean, Beck said that they were surprised to find that the Rutherfords held up remarkably well and, with some slight modifications, sea recovery of the boosters would likely save the company some money while they worked towards their new neutron rocket which is designed to land in much the same way that the SpaceX Falcon 9 does. Adding to this, on April 17th, Rocket Lab announced HASTE, the Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron. This version of their Electron rocket is focused on helping develop hypersonic suborbital flights and the technology needed to make those more reliable. Their first launch of the system is planned for the first half of 2023 for a confidential customer, likely the U.S. Department of Defense. Hypersonic suborbital flights have been discussed for quite some time as a way to quickly get people and supplies around the world without a plane. In fact, way faster than a plane could manage. The idea is that a rocket would launch, but instead of pushing into orbit, it uses the fuel normally meant for orbiting to control where the rocket comes down. This, plus some landing hardware, allows for some very fast movement around the globe with some early experiments suggesting that a suborbital vehicle could get passengers from Australia to Europe in just 90 minutes. SpaceX has even toyed with this idea for their Starship, using the big lander version of their vehicle to deliver emergency goods faster than current disaster response would be able to. So, this haste announcement gives Rocket Lab two ways to reuse pre-flown equipment. Refurbishing engines and hull boosters for more orbital missions is the goal and would lower the cost of operating Electron in the same way that SpaceX has with its Falcon 9. But being able to make use of refurbished engines for some less strenuous suborbital equipment testing seems like a pretty smart way to get even more out of Electron. So, Rocket Lab can focus on getting Neutron up and running. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.